On today's Movie Talk, we've got a mini FYC for you. And on top of that, the Marvel vs. Director debate continues, but from a different angle this time. And then, oh, hey, is Disney putting Fox films in the vault? Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Collider Movie Talk. We've got a really interesting lineup for you today, and you know things will only get more interesting with Jeff Snyder on the panel. And we are also going to be joined by Mark and Draco. I hope Stephen King stuff comes up at some point. Give us a question about that. But before we get there, let's get into that call sheet. First item on the list is that Disney Vault story. So there's a great piece on Vulture right now that I do urge you to read, but we're going to discuss it in depth on today's show. And Just to give you the gist of the story right now, the article states more and more film programmers and theater managers were reporting that they had suddenly and cryptically been told by their studio contacts that Fox's back catalog was no longer available to show. Why is that alarming? We're going to get into it in a little bit. Next up here, again, that mini FYC is coming your way in just a bit because not only do we have the 2019 Gotham Award nominations, but we also have the very first reactions to Greta Gerwig's Little Women adaptation. More on that in just a bit. Now, if you're a Neil Blomkamp fan, we have an update on his next project. It's being reported that Taylor Kitsch will be starring in his latest sci-fi thriller called Inferno. It's about a cop in New Mexico who investigates a seemingly ordinary murder, only to discover that the perpetrator is an alien monster. I am looking forward to that one. Oh no, this next one's a little bit of a bummer. Hot on the heels of the news that the entire Marvel TV division is being reworked, another Marvel show has been cut. Freeform has canceled Cloak and Dagger after two seasons. The only remaining live action Marvel TV series are Hulu's upcoming Hellstrom and the currently running Runaway which launched its third season in December. What we're wondering right now is, will that be canceled soon after? We're going to keep an eye on the situation as it continues to develop. And finally here, Matt Goldberg wrote a great piece about this whole situation that we have been covering extensively, the Marvel versus director debate. But the thing is, we're not rehashing the same conversation. Matt comes at it from a very specific angle, and we're going to get into it on today's show. So stay tuned for some very, very important points on that matter. Oh, I'm on camera. I don't know. Cody was doing like a little dance back there. You were d- I was busy watching you. Hi, what's up? That was the call sheet. I hope you enjoyed it. Now we get to introduce our panelists. It's Friday. Give me a break here. Mark Andrico, Jeff Snyder, welcome to the table. Thanks for having me. How are you? Do- I feel like we haven't seen you in way too long. Yeah, I haven't, to? I haven't seen you in forever. No, things are good. Things are good. You know, the year is wrapping up. I just got back from a week in New York. And as we were talking about, yes, October yes. in New York is the only time I think I could live there full time. So, October is a special month in New York, but New York is also a year round place. <laughs> uh, it's a little claustrophobic for me. It's a little understandable. I'm, I'm much more an L.A. guy than a New York guy. Okay. but. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? I swing both ways <laughs> when it comes to L.A. and New York. <laughs> All right. I mean, I wouldn't have articulated it quite that way, but I can respect that. Yeah. As do I. All right. Let's get into the first topic here. Yeah. I know a lot of you have been asking, where is Collider FYC? I'm not going to tell you specifically where it is or when you're getting a new episode, but I will promise you that you are getting an episode very, very soon. But right now we're going to do a little FYC preview because we did have two big stories break recently. One, the Gotham Award nominations and two, the first reactions to Greta Gerwig's Little Women. So you guys saw some of the tweets out there. I think we actually have a couple. Let's pull up this one from uh, Kara Warner first. Do, there we go. All right, so Kara wrote, Greta Gerwig's Little Women is wonderful, a loving, meticulously crafted adaptation that exceeded my expectations, heartfelt, moving, and a terrific showcase for its extremely talented cast and beloved source material. Let's grab one more before we jump into this conversation from Amy Kaufman, who writes... Joe's lines in Little Women resonate with me completely differently now as a 33-year-old single writer wanting to remain independent but wanting to be loved. Greta's take on the story made me connect with Joe in a way I never had. As a girl, I just thought she was crazy to reject Lori. All right. 
this is just scratching the surface of some of the tweets out there. There weren't very much, mm -hmm. to be completely honest. Only a select group has seen this movie. Did it convince you that this movie is firmly in the awards race this year? Oh, it's absolutely in the awards race. It's her, it's her big follow-up to... Uh, no, I'm blanking. Lady, Bird. It's Lady Bird. Thank you. It's Friday morning. I'm not done with my <laughs> coffee yet. And it's a classic novel. I mean, I mean, I do. I want to see another version of that. I kind of feel remakes of Little Women are like Martha Wen Martha Wayne's death in a Batman movie. I don't need to see the pearls anymore. Mm -hmm. But the trailer's great. The trailer really swayed me substantially because the cast is that's a dream cast yeah. for that movie. So all right, Jeff. Do I, I mean, dare are ask? the Indiana Pacers <laughs> are in the hunt for the NBA championship if they make the playoffs? No. Uh, this movie is going to be showered with nominations because of its cast and its filmmaker and the source material and the affection that people have for this title, and it's not going to win a single Oscar. Why do you say that? Call it a hunch. All right. I, I think if it was a good movie, I thought if it was, if it was a real winner, they, they would have shown it to me already. Oh, oh, that's where this comes from. Uh, is it is it specifically like the small pool no, I mean, of people? It, no, because it's it's not coming like that. I'm not saying like, well, the Irishman's not going to win any Oscars because if it was good, they would have shown it to me. I'm saying that about this movie because I don't think it's going to win a single Oscar. Well, I do think that examining the rollout of reactions and when this movie screens and for who could be a sign of that because we talk about that every single year. Where and also a too, it's got it's coming out as the first. It's a movie about women written and directed by a woman a classic novel and it has resonance to today's situation with women in the workforce that's been always an issue um i think like jeff it's going to get a ton of oscar nominations i think not have not having seen it yet i think it'll probably get a definitely it has its best chance for best adapted screenplay because every okay. every tweet i've read has talked about the adaptation itself it's it's the same thing like last year where I thought A Star is Born was the best movie of the year. And I also th thought there's no way it can win Best Picture because it's the fourth version of this story. Um, huh. So I, this is the seventh or eighth version of Little Women. No one, we don't, we just simply don't need it. I don't care uh, how it modernizes the story. Um, you know, I think Florence Pugh could is probably its best chance at a nomination. Still don't think she's going to win. If Saoirse gets in, don't think she's going to win. If Greta gets in, don't think she's going to win. I, I just It's a, it's an also ran this year, which is fine. Maybe it'll be a great movie, and, it, and it's a different kind of thing in the marketplace. Oh, it's going to um, make a fortune, though. It's going to make $100 million. This oh, movie's going to play through the holidays. I do not think so. This is, this, is, this is the young girl equivalent of a Jurassic World for boys. There's the, there's the nostalgia of this. There's what? so much. There, well, you know, if, pe if, if people only saw kids are reading this story anymore, Mark, people, they're not. They're people, reading Harry Potter. I don't know. I think uh, you're not the audience for this. This is 13 year old girls. This is still, I think this is going to be a slow okay. burn hit over Christmas. It's, 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 it's nerd porn for girls. I mean, really, if it, if it is of a certain caliber and it winds up having a very, very long run at the box office, that's when I would be more encouraged. I actually think this could be the reverse of, let's say, a Star is Born, where Star is Born leaves TIFF, one of the hottest titles out there for award season, scoops up all these nominations, and then we just watched as more movies came out, and then the buzz behind that one fizzled out. That's why I think positioning yourself towards the end of November, mm -hmm. beginning of December, is still prime time to release an Oscar contender, and I don't know, if it captures hearts like these two tweets expressed with critics, fans, all the, the voting Academy members, and uh, just the wide movie-going public, well, I think it's got a good shot. That second tweet shows you how passionate the audience is going to be for that, because that tweet was that woman's biography. I mean, As a 31, 33 year old single writer looking for love, I'm challenged. She didn't really but, talk about the movie, but the movie resonated with her on a like a bone marrow mm -hmm. deep level. So that also that passion <laughs> propels movies. Yeah, but like, <laughs> I I know Amy, and uh, and I'm, I think I bet Little Women was one of her fa absolute favorite books. And, uh, you know, she's a writer now, and, it, and so it speaks to her. But, like, how many journalists are voting for the Oscars? How many uh, journalists are out there buying tickets? I, I'm, I do not think this movie is going to make $100 million. I think that for women of a certain age, which is around our age, this means a lot, uh, and, and people who are older than us. But to younger generations, I don't see little kids uh, walking around with little women in their hand. Even with Timothy Chalamet in the movie. He's got, I mean, he really does have undeniable draw, too, to add him to the equation right now. We'll, we'll, we'll see about that one. I, I, don't, I don't recall Beautiful Boy uh, breaking the box office, and that was a great movie.
I gotta look up how it did with the with the limited run and the uh, the slow expansion. But I'm gonna check that as we continue on into the uh, the Gotham Awards right now. A lot of really cool nominations here. The first thing I just want to know is what of everything stands out to you? Is there any particular you know distributor that got the most nominations that you're happy to see, or does this change your Oscar predictions as far as nominations go at all? For me, not too much because the Gotham Awards are always they're not a real precursor for me um you have such a shit-eating grin on your face today i I can't can't wait i can't wait to dig into this (laughs) um i think that they're good to come out this early because it calls attention to some movies that most people have never heard of because there's a lot of movies this year that i was surprised were on Mm -hmm. there i was like oh that's a very like what um, anything come to mind uh once again i'm i'm i I, if i have the list in front of me but uh i I, i'm not gonna start rattling off all the titles but i would yeah, like, well, for example, uh, in the best screenplay, I've heard of t- three of the movies, and then the other That's two, fair. never heard of. Really? I never heard of High Flying Bird or... I feel it's like... Le- oh, well, I hear the... Um, the well, there's High Flying Bird and also The Last Black Man in San Francisco, mm-hmm. both of which I think, you know, like, I... I got a couple of emails mm-hmm. about them, but it wasn't, you know, the usual no. onslaught. And I feel like, in particular, Last Black Man in San Francisco, that came out a while yep, ago. Yeah. And it does feel like there was some talk, but not enough for me to say, oh, this is going to be a title to keep in mind through award season. And but now you, I'm more urgently uh, interested in seeing have it. Have either of you seen Uncut Gems? Is it as good as all the buzz or do they have a good publicist? I'm going soon and I'm very, I'm very, very much looking forward to yeah. it. But I've heard wonderful they things. They do have a good publicist on that, actually. Um, I think that there's actually a, a cult of personality surrounding A24. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the Gothams, as far as award season, don't matter one lick. Uh, they are a, a, a group of journalists and critics. And, you know, it's it's the hoity-toity indie, indie wire crowd. Um, yeah, these, these nominations don't matter at all, and there are some weird ones on here. I mean, I, I love, this is like classic, so just classic IndieWire. Wait, 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 what are the weird ones then, just so we get a sense of what uh, you mean? Breakthrough Director Award, Philip Eumann's Burning Kane. I mean, I pay attention to movies pretty closely, don't know what the hell that is. I mean, when he says I, he hasn't heard of two of the movies in screenplay category, that's crazy. Like, I've obviously heard of all, all these movies, but that one's a weird one. Uh, there, there are a couple like breakthrough series long form what is david makes man what is my brilliant friend i haven't even heard of these things yeah i can't speak to the series one but i think that the burning cane was probably one of the very few titles on this list that i wasn't aware of at all indie indie spirit awards but like less cool Uh, uh, who who cares (laughs) i kind of i mean i care from the perspective of you know, some of these movies are not going to make waves in the Academy Award conversation. And if getting a Gotham Award nomination is something that makes someone a little more aware of it, I am going to applaud that, especially when I see the director of The Mustang on the list. The Mustang is a movie that came out earlier this year that I think would be worthy for many Academy Award conversations right now. And it's probably not going to happen. So the fact that it's here and it's getting a little love from this group, I will applaud that. And also... I'm obsessed with looking at the breakthrough actor category because all we yeah. talk about is, you know, movies and packages mm-hmm. coming together and speculation and rising talent that we're rooting for. And this is where you find it between the breakthrough director category. And also, you know, look at the Nightingale. There you go. There's another movie that is not going to get any widespread love whatsoever. A very challenging film, very difficult subject matter to sit through. But Jeff, I know you can pronounce yeah. her name better than I can. Uh, Essling Franciosi. That's, that's a dynamite performance and listen a lot of these nominations i i like the nominations personally i haven't seen uncut gems but like uh, you know b- with the exception of midsommar uh, everything makes sense to me um on the on this with, list with you so you don't think midsommar should I, be I don't on know it? how in christ's name you you nominate that for best screenplay like if you if that's the best screenplay to you you ne- you are not looking hard enough uh what a, what a horrible I, I, screenplay. I might, I might disagree with that one, but a of lot every of, would. of everything that Midsommar. Mark, what do you think about Midsommar? Of everything Midsommar could be in the mix for, I think Florence Pugh is similar to Little Women, the way to go. What did you think of Midsommar, Mark? Um, I'm glad I saw it for free. 
<laughs> uh, I am. I am now. That, that, now that director for me is zero for two. I just think he. I said this earlier. He's a merchant of misery. I think he does. He tarts up movies that are just about suffering. And in both of his movies, they have some great performances. But the characters aren't people. They're chess pieces that he moves around. I think they're well made. But I thought Midsummer was was nonsense. Is isn't this just Marriage Story versus The Farewell? Isn't that what this this whole or, show what about is? Parasite? So Paris, is it, isn't it just yeah, Netflix no, no versus A24? Across the board, yeah, Parasite too. I think Parasite might have a chance to, to be a, a Best Picture winner. No. Huh. We're going to get into that. No. Keep an eye on the Collider Video YouTube channel because we're going to discuss that. I really tried hard. I set so that up for you. I put the ball you. right on the tee. I'm always, uh, I'm always here for an opportunity to plug our shows. But I was trying really hard to look up the box office data on Call Me By Your Name, but... A certain website redesign has made that very difficult oh, and has boy. made me very slow with picking up all that stuff now, and I'm not happy about it. Have you seen High Flying Bird? I haven't. Um, I liked it. I'm actually glad that it got a little love uh, today with Terrell Alvin McCraney, who wrote the script, and Andre Holland. He, Where, he did a good when job. did that debut? It's a Netflix movie. It came out in February. Way, way early. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. It was, it was, you know, but it's this Soderbergh film, and I haven't seen The Laundromat yet. But if The Laundromat is as good as High Flying Bird, I'll be delighted. I So I prioritized Laundromat at TIFF. And then as the festival went on and I was, you know, reorganizing my calendar, I heard some not so hot things about it. So I kind of bumped it to the bottom of my list and I am going to see it eventually. It's just not a priority did right it, now. Did either of you see Her Smell? No, I want to see that so badly. That's the Elizabeth, Elizabeth Moss. Moss one. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Did you like it? I saw it so long ago, I remember thinking it was interesting, but it didn't really stay with me. Yeah, it seems like a movie I'd hate. Well, the title <laughs> grosses me out. Well, if you go in with that mentality, hopefully it surprises you, uh, Jeff. I don't know. I don't want to think of the I'm sense of the of performers I'm watching. <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe that's fair. All right. Let's get into this second topic here. All right. As I teed up at the beginning of the show, I know many of you out there are sick of this whole Marvel versus director debate. And, you know, I think that's pretty reasonable at this point. But the reason that I reprogrammed it on the show today is because Matt Goldberg, I think, has a very, very interesting take on the subject. And I think it gets to the point more clearly than anything that I've read thus far based on like why this matters. I mean, the conversation has largely been like, who cares if Martin Scorsese doesn't like Marvel? That's not really what it's about. And it's not about defending Marvel if it hurts your feelings that he's not a big fan of Marvel. So after reading this article, is there any point in this article that Matt brings something up that you're like, I wish more people were talking about this right now? Well, I, I kind of wish more people were talking about the fact that I think what Scorsese and Coppola are talking about is studios don't make smaller movies now it's why the you know one critic talked about the joker and said if scorsese was pitching taxi driver today it might have to be a comic book adaptation because the studio is not going to make that movie so i think their complaint is misguided at marvel because those movies are successful and and hopefully will allow other movies to be made but it's the studio system mm -hmm. they don't we it's like the one percent they only make movies they'd rather make one 300 yeah. million dollar movie than 10 30 million dollar movies and that's hopefully going to change and marty has a, a big movie coming out that's a big deal and we're talking about martin scorsese kids who've never heard of him before mm -hmm. are now talking about him so there's a little bit of pr in that as well i think yeah. matt brings uh something to that effect up in his article it's like even though even though the term Marvel is used, it's almost used as a, more of like a catch-all phrase for things it's that lazy. are super hot yeah. and cost a lot of money and are big blockbusters. So that's specifically why that keyword is mm. being targeted right now. But it's not necessarily a direct, or at least in some cases, because some of those, some of the other comments out there were fairly direct. But this is a much bigger issue. I had highlighted one thing, two things here that he had written. Uh, just Marvel movies are just the most obvious representation of the system right now. And in the end of the article, he wrote, the discussion we're having when we ask these auteurs about Marvel movies isn't about what they like. It's about where the industry is headed and if it still has room for them. And that's the interesting part of the conversation. So based on what you read in Matt's article, uh, Jeff, what do you make of it? I mean, I think Matt's right that, that these guys, less so Scorsese, who can still get movies made uh, at studios, but a guy like Coppola is simply resentful that he cannot get a movie made. Like, you know, he's been trying to get Megalopolis off the ground at probably around a $75, $80 million budget. No one's giving him that money. And, and so when Matt says 
you know, Francis Ford Coppola is sitting there thinking like, I've made some of the greatest movies of all time and my last film opened in 16 theaters. There's a bitterness and, and that bitterness has to be directed at somebody. And, and so, you know, he's focusing that energy on, on Marvel. Like no, no one's sitting around bitching about Mortal Engines or a Pacific Rim uprising, which, you know, p- seem to mean a lot less uh, to people than m- most Marvel movies do, even like the worst Marvel movies. Um, so it's like, I understand those guys' frustration. I, I don't know that it's come out the ro- the right way. I don't yeah. know that I disagree with them either. But um, like, w- like with The Irishman, there were two studios that literally had the movie. <laughs> STX was making the movie. Paramount was ready to make the movie. They just weren't ready to make the movie at that price. Mm-hmm. And Netflix, with its deep pockets and unlimited resources, was. And speaking of all of that, since the movie had its premiere last night, you know, I, I have been going back and forth uh, with sources over there regarding the the budget of the film. And you know, there there, you know, pe- people familiar with uh, the process would say it costs around one fifty nine plus another fourteen or so to buy out back end. So that what? But like you know, when we talk about budgets for most movies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we don't talk about the back end participation. Yeah. Like, um, so, you know, Netflix gets it kind of unfairly like that. I've heard the budget is way higher. I've heard it's like 250. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're, if you are <sighs> Coppola or whoever, like maybe you even resent your buddy Scorsese to some extent. That's a lot of money. I mean, sitting there watching it again last night, I was thinking about how much had to go into it. You know, it, it's three hours and 30 minutes of content. Right, ex- ex- exactly. It, it, <laughs> So it has to cost more than a traditional two hour movie, Uh, not to mention the awards campaign. Like if you think that they went all out on Roma last year, sending a Roma pillow over here, I'm waiting for my Irish. You haven't seen anything because the spend this year for Netflix, I think is going to be in the vicinity of 80 to a hundred million dollars all in for all their titles, you know, with marriage story, (laughs) Irishman, et cetera. Irishman will probably get uh, 50 to 60 million of that. If they spent 40 last year on Roma, I mean, without weighing in on whether or not all that money, should be spent they have some of the most promising titles to me for the awards campaign i mean there's no doubt in my mind especially after seeing it again last night Mm -hmm. that irishman is going to clean up as far as nominations go but i will say last night was my second time seeing it the first time around like i didn't budge i didn't think about the restroom i was perfectly comfortable the entire time last night i was definitely getting like a little fidgety where i understand why this might be a little better suited just from that respect to be watched at home on your couch where you could press but i almost wish that i almost wish that rather than talking about marvel the next martin scorsese quote would be from the creator perspective when he thinks the best time in the middle is to push pause get up and stretch your legs because last night that's all i wanted to do my legs genuinely got achy because also when you go to one of those premiere events it takes it takes a good while for the movie to start. So in addition to the three and a half hours for the actual runtime, you're sitting there waiting for a lot longer at the beginning. And yeah, it, it kind of hurt. <laughs> I want to know how many of Martin Scorsese's movies in his career you could make for the cost of The Irishman. I bet his first 25 movies combined cost, cost much, less right. than The Irishman. That's how and I tend to like, to I like Scorsese with no budget. I got to say his big budget studio stuff I find to be his least interesting stuff. I like him scrappy and I, I think he's one of those directors that works better with $5 million than 150. So let's say that, you know, their concerns right now in regards to how big Marvel movies are and them not being able to get their stuff off the ground. Do you see, like, what do you see as the pro and con of that? Because to me, that means we've got the big, big budget movies. And then we also have, you know, the smaller budget A24 movies. Is there any, is there any good that happens with the changing landscape in that respect? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that the Joker changes the landscape because I just saw an article about the Joker is potentially going to make as much money for Warner Brothers as Avengers Endgame and that was a well that was a that was a relatively cheap film for a studio yeah I love that take on it I think Matt brought this up in his article too where where I think Todd Phillips has said something like the only reason he was able to do his character study is under the guise of a superhero movie which apparently Warner Brothers was was caught off guard by the success of this film I mean it's gonna make a billion dollars 
If you had told me that a month and a half ago, I'd be like, no, it's so not. So do you think but, projects like that are restricted to the superhero genre, or do you think Joker could maybe open up the door to more similar character studies that aren't part of a brand? Yes to both. I think I think of these directors like a Todd Phillips. After this movie, he can do whatever he wants to next. He might okay. choose something small. I think there's a lot of moving parts. I think studios will only make these smaller movies when people with clout force them to. But it has changed the landscape of, of filmmaking, for, especially with a superhero movie being that small of a budget and making a profit of half a billion dollars. That's that's landscape shifting. Yeah. I just think it's interesting. The Irishman probably costs more than most Marvel movies with the exception of an Endgame or Infinity War, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but like, does that give Marty license to talk because someone is giving him this mountain of money and instead of making a comic book movie, he is using it to tell this meditative three and a half hour gangster uh, film. Um, but I, I do think that Scorsese is in a different uh, bracket than the other filmmakers who have come out against, you know, Marvel movies, whether mm -hmm. it's Coppola, Ken Loach, Fernando Moran, yeah. Yeah, just to uh, add in a little something that pertains to how we discuss this uh, this topic the last couple of days, Matt also wrote in his article, which I think is a very valid point, being mainstream isn't the same as being respected. And I think what these Marvel fans still crave is legitimacy. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think no matter what your taste is, your taste deserves to be respected. And I think that's still an issue at play here where I almost wish that these comments were more tailored to what they really mean so that we could use those comments for good and maybe change where the spending is happening in the future so we can accommodate all movies of all budget sizes. Why, why does Martin Scorsese have to validate their taste, you know? I, I just, I don't understand that part. Of I don't it. think it's necessarily validate. Yeah, he doesn't use the word validating. I think it's more just a, a sign of respect. Like, I, like I respect that your feelings about Midsummer are different than mine. I'm not going to invalidate your opinion oh, well, that's, because that's, it's different that's a than problem. mine. That's a problem yeah. with society now. So, I, not, me not liking something doesn't mean it's bad. There are bad movies I don't like, but there are movies that just aren't for me that I can respect. And I think everyone takes, with the internet and the anonymity, people take ownership of things that's crazy to me, that unless you own stock in Disney, I don't know why you care if a Marvel movie is successful or not. If you like it, great. But I think that, it, that, that, that we also are in an age of people read that quote from Martin Scorsese, but don't read the whole article, and it's not contextualized. Yeah, we were So you read these articles, too. and they're actually not saying what the, what the, quote, the quote says. Out of context, it feels very, very mean and very too hip for the room, but you read it, and there's more thought behind that. Mm -hmm. But we're trained to, to talk in these definitive sentences. I mean, even on this show, like, you know, people get mad when I say, well, you know, this is bad. And they're supposed to say, well, you're, well, you're supposed to say, I think this is bad. But I'm, it's like as a pundit, my job is to make my opinion almost sound like fact. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I understand what you mean to a point. It's, I mean, it's, it's about backing your own opinion, believing your own opinion and expressing that opinion in a way where you validate it in the process of, you know, your review or whatever we're talking about. But I think there is a big divide between doing exactly that, mm -hmm. but doing that in a way that puts somebody else's, uh, not opinions, but, but taste and and Put feeling it down, right. yeah i think as long as we we walk that line with respect then yeah exactly what you just and, said and applies I think francis crossed that line by calling the films despicable like oh that's you know, yeah. that's yeah, that's a buzzword that is just yeah um I, I wouldn't even go that far uh but yeah i don't know i think there is a thing that that's good but there is a difference between good taste and bad taste um yeah all right, all right. We're gonna. We'll probably be covering this uh, a little more. But I want to come, come back for the I good taste, bad imagine. taste one. All right, all right. That's, that's awesome. I mean, that is a, a worthwhile conversation that we can save for another day if you guys are interested. But I am gonna urge you to read Matt's full article. It is a great read. So we have the uh, the link to that article in the description section of today's movie talk. And I'm gonna urge you to read articles when you see a headline like this that makes you go, "Well, screw Martin Scorsese." Read the article. I'm guilty of that. We're all guilty of that. Sometimes we mm -hmm. post an article with the headline. Read the articles because what's great about this is the discussion about film and the diversity of film. Mm -hmm. Let's not talk about your, your dad is stronger than my dad. Let's talk about how this can make film as a medium far more interesting than it is right yeah. now. And speaking of articles to read, our third topic is all about another article I'm going to urge you to read. But before we get there, we've got some cool content coming your way on Collider Video, like all of this stuff. 
Hey everyone, John Roca here, the host of Collider Mailbag. A new episode drops every Saturday and Sunday in your face and in your ears, answering the questions from you fans about the world of entertainment, film, and television. Me and great guests from our sphere do the best to answer your questions from Twitter, from Instagram, and of course, email as well, every Saturday and Sunday. What's up, Collider fans? Ryan Satin here from ProWrestlingSheet.com, where you can find the top stories throughout the week in the world of professional wrestling. If you're a wrestling fan like myself, then you'd be doing yourself a disservice by not checking out all the shows we do every week on YouTube.com slash C slash Wrestling Sheet. In particular, on Wednesdays, we've got a SmackDown recap show hosted by John Roca and myself, where we pick apart and, and talk about every little thing that happened on the Blue Brand. So do yourself a favor and go subscribe at youtube.com slash C slash wrestling sheet. All right, time to get into this third topic, which is a big one. It's, it is a big deal that Disney is kind of uh, secretly vaulting certain classic Fox films right now. This is the, a great piece that I highly recommend reading on Vulture, but right now we're going to talk about it right here on the table. Uh, you read a report like this, do you take it as a really big deal that could be problematic in the future? 100%. There are so many theaters that depend on these repertory screenings to keep the doors open because the margins that they give to studios are so high now. And what Disney is doing is the is what we all knew Disney was going to do mm -hmm. when they bought up everything. They're going to control these films. They're going to make them only available on their streaming service. And it's going to it's going to put a lot of screens out of business. I will not be surprised if in the next five years, Disney buys a theater chain that just shows their, because they own everything already. I've said that before on this show, and I, I believe it's against the law right now, well, but I, I still wouldn't put it past them to make it happen. In, in the America we live in, what is against the law anymore? And if you have enough money, I just think it's a bummer because movies are meant to be seen in the theater and the fact that so many kids aren't going to get to see there was one of those articles was about a horror movie festival and they asked yeah. for a print of the omen and they're like no the omen's never going to be shown on disney plus so where is that going to be you know i just think it's holding our artwork i think it's holding our art and our history hostage you're right <laughs> i completely agree with mark and draco i think in this story the term despicable is fair this is despicable however i know you're not going to believe me I think that there's going to be a happy ending to this story as there is with most Disney movies. Here's the deal. I know rep screenings, repertory screenings, do not bring in much cash for Disney, but you also don't make money having films sit in a vault. Um, movies are made for audiences, and I think that common sense and cooler heads will prevail in this situation. I think that they probably just pulled everything out to sort of see what they have since this is still very early in the Disney Fox days and they've had much higher priorities mm -hmm. over there. I think at the end of the day, they're going to say this is bad PR for us. Mm -hmm. This is just, it's just stupid. It doesn't make sense. Well, it's counter to Disney because Disney before home video was all about re-releasing movies and movies shown in repertories. You, you know, Pinocchio came out every five years and stuff like that. Right. So it was, it was the same yet different. So by just removing these films from the, the playing field is just, I think that the company is going to reverse course on this. I, I don't think that Bob, I, I think Bob Iger is pretty um, sensitive to, to, public sentiment mm -hmm. i think that's and disney also saw really uh, reverse course and apologize to james gunn bringing him back for guardians of the galaxy 3 uh you, you even saw it with the spider-man deal you know they, they were trenched to their mm -hmm. corner like i think it's going to wind up like that and i think that you the american consumer are going to get exactly what you want Wow, well, I hope that is right. like the greatest sunny outlook I've ever heard. I know heard we from saw me. It animated, makes me so, animated it makes me really happy. Yeah, really. Stuff. I wish we could we could put that in in post. Um, just to answer this question a little, based on the Vulture article, why is Disney doing this? I think it's important to bring up these points. According to their article, the most commonly floated theory is that the company is trying to give consumers one more reason to subscribe to Disney Plus, which. You know, I'm still rooting for what you just said, Jeff. That does make sense to me. And then they also wrote a more convincing theory is that this is just how Disney does business. 
Further into the article, and this gets into the whole thing about how they like to exhibit their movies, and I, I find this a little alarming too. More than one exhibition professional contacted for the article speculated that Disney's overall goal is to claim as many screens at a theater as possible for its newer titles. Disney considers any screen that's taken up by an older movie, even one owned by Disney, to be a screen that could be showing the new Marvel or Star Wars title instead or showing orangutans for to an audience of three. Do you see any legitimacy in that business practice? Absolutely. I mean, the, the margins now that studios get on the, for the first five weeks of a release, and most movies don't stay in the theater that long anymore, is crazy. It's like 90-10. And now Disney, Disney can be able to say things like, oh, you have to show this Star Wars movie on your biggest screen for six weeks, no matter what, even if it's empty. And the theater owners are being held hostage by that. It's just, it's just a real bummer. It's a real bummer because there should, we need diversity of films. I love the fact that the Marvel films are successful in all the Disney films, but you can't live on a diet of ice cream alone. You need some vegetables occasionally. And I think this just, once again, limits the marketplace. And it makes me sad that people don't go to the movies because going to a movie theater and seeing a movie filled with people in that group experience, is there's nothing like it. And as that gets rarer and rarer, it's just, it just I guess I'm getting older, but it just makes me sad because yeah. that, that shared sense of community of these arts, of art and mythology is just, is something that's fun and it connects us all. And I think it just, we're getting more and more isolated. Please give me a sunny outlook on... Uh the theatrical scenario right now, Jeff. Uh, in in terms of, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't. In terms quite understand. of uh, Disney's business practices, as far as holding theater owners uh, hostage, in a sense, by trying to gobble up as many screens for their big Marvel and Star Wars releases, let's say, but also making those arrangements that forces them to put something like an orangutan's four in theaters as well. I, I, I thought that the most interesting uh, part of that article, or not the most interesting, but one of the interesting parts was the market share thing. Yeah. And that they're, they're like just trying to shut out, you know, a, a Sony movie, a Universal movie. If they can get a Disney movie on that screen, then it means that, you know, these other studios suffer. Uh, so it's kind of diabolical, but at the same time, like, what are you, Disney's a business. Like, this is a competition. This is America. Like, I, I just, I don't understand what yes, people America, want from them. Should they America, roll over? And in America, we, we try not to have monopolies, theoretically. And, and Disney probably does have a monopoly with close to 40% and growing yeah. uh, in terms of box office share. But, I mean. They it, have five, six movies this year that have grossed over a billion dollars, and we still have Frozen 2 and Star Wars. That's insanity. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they, they have the goods, but like, I, I, like, what do you, could, could, could Paramount have hung on to Marvel? Yeah, they could have. Like, are you, do we want Disney to make stupid business decisions? Like, I don't understand. But diversity is good for the marketplace. I, as a, Absolutely. as someone in the comic book world, it, the Marvel DC thing, if Marvel goes away, the comic books go away. It's if good, DC but, goes but away, if you're a theater owner, how do you not give audiences what they want? They want Marvel movies. So but what, the, but the what the article is saying is Disney is now at a place where they can say, we're not giving the audiences what they want. If we're showing a theater, if we're locking up a theater showing Orangutan's 4 that three people are seeing and another film from another studio is not being a chance to be exhibited. Disney's, I'm all for if a movie is selling out make as much money as possible but, but this is this is playing both sides of that for but Disney. a theater owner wouldn't make that deal unless it made sense for them financially so if it's like i got it i get the one pick in the draft which is star wars and then i have to settle for the last pick in the draft which is orangutans four that the one the one in the 99 pick may be more valuable than two three four five six i just wish we lived in a world where people respected certain business needs but also you know the idea of uh leaving moviegoers with with choice. Like that's that's the scarier thing to me. It's obviously I know Marvel movies are very popular right now. I just don't want to live in a world where I'm forced to only see something like a Marvel movie in the theaters and that seems to be the direction that we're heading in right now. I I wonder if more regulations as far as how theater chains can work with, you know, maybe streaming services and also gigantic companies like Disney. I, I wonder if that's the way to go about it, because I can't remember if this term was used in the Vulture article or if I saw it on someone's commentary mm -hmm. elsewhere, but that this plan, like the vaulting thing included, is short sighted, like eventually this bubble to me has to burst. I know we, you know, we roll our eyes when we talk about Marvel fatigue, but 
if we live in a world where big screen experiences are limited to just a small handful of franchises, I do feel like that bubble is going to burst at some point. Whereas if we had more diverse content in uh, theaters that could one, serve the Marvel film franchise well, for example, but also leave room for these other original projects, mid budget movies. That's the thing. These movies make so much money. How, let's have Disney make some twenty million dollar and thirty million dollar films. Use some of that money to for good to just have some diversity. I'm not, not I'm not on one side of the fence or either. I think there's the movies are a good movie is a good movie whether mm -hmm. it's a three hundred million dollar movie or some French New Wave film. But what we're getting is that, and I'm wondering if Disney's next step is going to be that marquee pricing, where you pay twenty five dollars for an Avengers movie and four dollars for a revival of The Little Mermaid. Mm -hmm. That's going to change the landscape too because that's going to that's going to be what Disney's done with theme parks. It's going to start pricing people out of movies. I, I think people, that's, that is how it should be. Like why David Spade does a really good comedy a bit about this. Like why is he paying the same amount to see Titanic and to see some mumblecore movie, you know? Oh boy. This that's is, another I, episode. That's a whole other see, episode. It, I mean, it really is. I, I mean, you guys well know. I love talking mm -hmm. about this kind of stuff. Certain things about it scare me, but I don't know. We could also be in a really exciting time where in a year from now, we could be working with a completely different type of way of going to Well, that's the thing. There's so, many, there's so many variables that we don't know about. Yeah. It makes us all scared because we don't have any, any real solid information. So Uncertainty is always scary. Yes. You just keep your fingers crossed that it works out for the better. <laughs> All right, before we have to say goodbye to you guys, let's get into some live chat questions because Do it. there's some good ones here. I have to grab this one from Steve Calderon. What are your thoughts on the criticism of the redesign of Box Office Mojo that now includes a paywall to look at some data? Jeff, did you have some feelings about this? It's the worst this? thing ever. Yeah. Uh, why do why I don't understand why companies tinker with things that are perfect? Like everyone uses Twitter. Hey, let's do an update and completely change everything. Facebook, Twitter, now Box Office Mojo. I'm sick of it. Leave things alone. I don't care how they look. Just make the functionality but, the same. But remember when Box Office Mojo did this before, about three years ago, they changed it for like two days and mm -hmm. everyone hated it so much they went back. I agree. Change for change's sake makes you look more dated than a dated website. Box Office Mojo was simple, easy to read, easy to navigate, and now it just feels it feels like McDonald's is serving things on bone china. Mm -hmm. it, it, they, they don't belong together. I've tried so hard not to comment on this since it happened because I, I live on Box Office Mojo. I oh, use it all the time. Yeah. Sometimes I just look at the website for fun because I'm always curious, and I try to keep in mind how upset, you know, some of our viewers get when we change up our, uh, our you know, our shows, our formats, whatever, and hopefully for the better from our perspective, but I know when you, when you have something and you like that that thing over and over again, the guaranteed way you're used to getting it. I know it's difficult to uh, roll with the change. So. I don't mind the font changes. It's just a, the site is just confusing. <laughs> I now. tried to roll with the changes for a 24 hour yeah. period. No, just, like it doesn't work. It makes everything. Off on this it, ma update? it makes everything extremely difficult to me. Like I, I can't look up numbers quickly on the show anymore. And then I don't know if this has anything to do with the redesign. But the other day, I was just trying to look up Antlers to see what the release date was, yeah. and Antlers isn't on their that's site. Is I, that something that's, that's, that's behind? That's what I use it for more than anything is release date stuff, even more than box office, and it's, it's very, a nightmare. It's very difficult to navigate the future releases. Yes. Now I like what they did, putting like a handy release calendar right on the side but if you want to look up future releases it's not as easy as just like clicking to the next month you got to go to a pull down tab put in the year put in the month and i'm, I'm not no i'm not a fan i'm not a fan go back please go back all right i wanted to get in a stephen king question Yay. for you all right i've got all right i got two here let's do all right let's do this one from i'm not going to pronounce this right uh, Nintaro456, who's asking top three Stephen King movies or top three Stephen King books you want to see in theaters that have not yet received the adaptation on the screen. The top three Stephen King movies for yes. me that were theatrical releases in no particular order would be It, The Dead Zone, and Stand By Me. Stand By Me, Stand By me is one of my top five favorite movies mm -hmm. of all time. So Stand By Me... Shining, Misery. Those, those 
or right on my list as well. If I we had more space, yeah. But I think the Dead Zone is one of the most underrated. It's the most underrated. Um, Cronenberg film. Mm -hmm. If that movie came out today, Christopher Walken would absolutely get an Oscar nomination. So would um, Martin Sheen. That is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful film. I haven't revisited the movie in a very, very long it has time. Aged I just beautifully. Lis I listened to the book though, and really good. And you know what else? I listened. I uh, read recently. The last physical book I read is because you gave it to me. Night the Shift dark, or dark the Dark Half? half. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's great. Um, I would go, uh, Perry. I love your three. I'd probably go The Shining, Stand By Me, and Shawshank. Solid choices right there. Did we miss? Misery's close. Oh, what was the, oh, top three uh, books. Are there any books that haven't been adapted yet that you want to see? From King? I mean, actually, the ones that come to mind right now, I know are in the works. I just uh, I, I just like read The Long Walk for the first mm -hmm. time, and I know they're doing that very, very soon. And then uh, The Outsider, which we have a trailer for, and I think the trailer and the casting in that is phenomenal. That was the last one I had finished, yeah. and it is a great, great read. I'm looking forward to the the potential of a Salem's Lot feature film because Salem's Lot is a, still holds up. It's, it's, a, it's a really scary, scary book, yeah. and I think we have yet to have a great version of that. I think that is well worth an update. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's see if we can get another question in here before we say goodbye. J. Scott for real. If you could create an award for some under-recognized slash under-appreciated aspect of filmmaking, what would you choose? So not necessarily a new Oscar category because we do talk about the same category, like casting director, stunts, all that good stuff. But is there any un undervalued uh, area of film that you think we need to give more more love to? Um, I think I, I do wish, and this goes to the Oscars actually, but I do wish we had a category for comedy musical because I think sometimes comedies performances don't get the appreciation and with the immediacy and that they have. And I also think we need an award for best cameo because some of these roles, like Judy Dench, she's great, but there are people, you know, I, I, I just think there are, a cameo appearance would be an interesting Oscar to have. Okay. I'm going to go best soundtrack, which is different than best <laughs> oh, score yes, and different right. than best song. But the, the caveat is, is all these movies on the soundtrack, they have to be in the movie. I, I'm sick of these soundtracks where it's all these songs that weren't actually in the They're movie. The credits, Music yeah. inspired by uh, whatever. Like, no. Uh, I, I want like the crow had like 14 great songs in the movie. That's what's on the soundtrack, and it should have won why, an Oscar. Why are you? Uh, I, I know you're very into the crow in general, but why has this been coming up in conversation a lot lately? The crow? Yeah, because it's almost Devil's Night. Ah, uh, well, yeah. Is that why you put it in the in the I am, Yes, I want to have a screening at my place. Oh, okay, I invite okay. all my coworkers. If you haven't seen the crow, come to my place. Fad starts going. That movie's terrible. You know uh -oh. what, guys? to have my revenge <laughs> keep it to yourself right now um i i think for this to veer away from oscar stuff so in a lot of my interviews i always ask uh who's the unsung hero of your production and it's pretty much just because i don't know i think we need to talk about more uh, you know like more a plus pas like that that random person who was just there when you needed on a really tough day of shooting because Obviously, we say this a lot. There are so many people that work on a movie, and you don't know who could have made the biggest difference on a particular scene, and it might not be the headline name that you're familiar with. And now we don't watch credits because you can skip them on Amazon and Netflix, and unless it's a Marvel movie, you're not going to sit through them, and, and who reads them? So, yes, that's that's actually a good one, a below-the-line award yeah. for... You know, most like the most important person, the unsung hero. That's I mean, a even great like a, award. Like a caterer or something, because you don't even know. You could be in the worst mood ever, and then you have a good meal, and it completely changes uh, your day. I'm serious. <laughs> no, it does. I, I like it. I like it. <laughs> could it be like an A-list star's drug dealer or the hooker in their trailer? That's the, that's those, the independent spirit awards. Yeah, those would be for a different type of award ceremony. I, do, I know we're running out of time, but I want to get this one question in, especially with uh, Jeff on the panel right now. Oh, Star no. Orbit's agent is asking, how much do Oscar campaigns really sway the voters? Is print media and promotional material gifts really effective? No. I don't think any of it is effective. I, I, I really don't. I, I think that someone like Monique can, can be like, you know what? I'm not campaigning. I'm not shaking any hands. I'm not kissing any babies. You either think I'm, I, I deserve an Oscar or not. Melissa Leo basically ran her own campaign. Uh, look at Green Book. 
could you run a worse campaign last year? <laughs> like everything that went wrong could went wrong and it's still won. Why? Because people care about the movies. They don't care about your campaign or what your ads look like or what your Q&A was like. I mean, that is all helps for phase one nomination stuff. But the, the, winning an Oscar, that's a record book. You are in the record books and they don't you know, do that because you ran a good campaign. I think everything you said is very valid and very possible, but I also think the flip side does have some value too. And it's not necessarily someone getting a Roma pillow in the mail right. and saying, I'm going to vote for what Roma. Money. I think it's more of an awareness thing. If all of a sudden you were invited to uh, a screening and they had a great Q&A after and someone just said something that stuck in your mind, that could make make you think about that particular movie all throughout award season. It's just about being constantly reminded of these titles so that when you're filling out your ballots, that's the first thing on your mind and not another competing production. To play devil's advocate, though, isn't a good Q, a good Q&A for a bad movie doesn't make you like the bad movie. It's ultimately the movie. And if there's a good Q&A, it gives you depth of movies and, and that sort of thing. But does do that, the, that is the hope. Maybe that wasn't the best example. No, I'm not, I'm, not, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not coming at you. Yeah, but, yeah. I think, but I think I've seen I've seen entertaining Q&A's for god awful movies. Oh, so and I've seen I. bad Q&A's for great movies. Ultimately, I think it's are you thinking about this movie when you're driving home? Are you thinking about it the next morning? And sure. all the other stuff is just gravy and I think, noise. I think that that is definitely accurate too, but I, I still think the constant assault of like, remember this, remember this title, and the next remember this title, leading up to when you place your votes for nominations or wins, I do think that in some cases that can be effective. The biggest threat to me to all that stuff is block voting, which you know has really been an issue with the TV Academy, mm -hmm. um, with people you know from their only voting for shows from their own networks and I think that you're starting to see like Netflix definitely like employ more and more Academy members in the goal of shifting that perception from the, the Academy's anti-Netflix to well we employ 70% of the Academy I feel like on today's movie talk we have gotten three worthwhile conversations that could fill an entire future show mm -hmm. that is definitely something we need to be discussing further maybe on FYC which you should keep an eye out for seriously trust me I'm not giving you a date right now keep an eye on the collider video YouTube channel guys thank you so much for spending your Friday morning with me because we don't see you very often Mark can yeah. you tell everybody where to find uh, you on the internet uh, I am on Twitter at, at Mark Andreco I'm on Facebook um, if you don't like politics and you're not a lefty you don't want to follow me. Um, and then Schmodown and comic books. And yeah, I'm, I'm around probably more than people want. <laughs> I, not enough on this show. Come back and visit I would love us to. again. This was, this was such a great conversation. I really wish we could stay and do like three more hours about this. I, because I would have. This, if these we, are three, we all have We all have different viewpoints and they're all very interesting and very yeah. valid. So. so many wonderful Collider shows that need to go into production on this set. Jeff, thank you again for being here today. Adam in the booth, Dorian in the live chat. You guys rock as always. A huge thanks to everybody out there for spending your week with us. You got some great content coming your way on Collider Live at 10 a.m. p.m and all throughout the weekend on the Collider Video YouTube channel. And then we will be back 9 a.m. Pacific with a brand new episode that we got a cool guest on Monday. You do not want to miss it. Trust me on that one, too. Much we'll see cooler you Monday. than me.